All right, hello there everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this quick video here. We are doing a lovely interview with our April Share Your Story winners, the uh, Mennonite Economic Development Associates, or MEDA. Um, I'm on the line here with Katie West, who's the Communications Coordinator, and uh, Mushtaba Ali, who is the Technical Specialist for Environment and Climate Change uh, Technical Team at MEDA. So welcome, folks, and thanks so much for joining me on the line today. Um, super excited to dive into your story here and, and talk a little bit about sort of your, um, your April Share Your Story submission that you gave us. So I wanted to start off a little bit with just kind of a, a quick introduction to what your organization uh, is, what it does, sort of, and, and you know, tell me a little bit about MEDA. Uh, yeah, so I can do that. Um, so MEDA is an economic development, international economic development organization that uh, creates business solutions to poverty. Um, and what that means is that we're looking for sustainable, measurable, uh, scalable and replicable solutions um, to global poverty. And one of the things that we um, believe about poverty eradication is that um, business is part of the solution to that. Um, business intersecting with um, environment and climate change, uh, gender equality and social inclusion, um, market system development, impact investing and inclusive financial services. Um, we believe that the inter intersection between those um, areas with business um, creates a sustainable solution to poverty that benefits everyone. And this is um, a work methodology that we've um, used for over 60 years in over 70 countries around the world. Um, and that's anywhere from Nicaragua to Myanmar to Nigeria. Um, we have worked in all different regions of the world uh, for different aspects. So whether that's in market systems uh, more heavily or gender equality work um, or the intersection of market systems and gender equality, um, those are the kinds of work that we do all around the world. So yeah, that's kind of a little bit about what we do. Awesome. And so MEDA does have kind of quite a focus on environmental and climate change initiatives. Um, and, and the story that you wrote in about was the was in Myanmar. Uh, and, you know, maybe let's chat a little bit about that particular story that you wrote about, because it sounds quite fascinating what you're doing there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So um, Myanmar is a predominantly rural country and it relies a lot on agriculture for its uh, national income. Um, but recently, because of climate change, and we're seeing this uh, across the world, climate change is impacting uh, rainfalls and weather patterns um, and dryness, desertification, uh, you know, and, and those kinds of things. And that's something Myanmar is seeing, particularly um, less predictable rainfall, rainfall and um, increased dryness in parts of the country. Um, and there's also been uh, a growth recently in consumer demand for uh, chemical less, chemical free, and organic produce. And this is kind of a newer um, aspect to agriculture in the country because it, for many years it's been quite closed off um, from the rest of the world due to different political um, and social reasons. And so um, the Harmony Myanmar Agro Group um, opened its doors for business to basically in, in anticipation of this growth in demand of organic produce. So realizing that farmers that want to um, have organic uh, produce, they'll need to have organic inputs to support the produce that they would like to grow. So for example, that includes fertilizers, um, yeah, different soil, um, you know, watering techniques, um, you know, all those kinds of things. And so um, Nita, saw what Harmony Agro Group wanted to do. And so we decided to partner with them through a business matching grant program um, to expand their retail outlets, um, where they work with women farmers to improve their knowledge of good agricultural practices and provide them access to quality seeds and fertilizers that, um, for example, a fertilizer created from chicken manure, um, those kinds of things that are better for the environment, better for the soil. Um, and so that their produce can be um, certified as organic. So that's a little bit um, about, about that business in particular. Um, and what they're also doing is um, they're partnering with women in rural villages to um, teach them more about good agricultural practices. And then those women themselves teach their communities 
um, about these good agricultural practices um, and uh, you know managing a production quality, um, produce quality, uh, rice seedlings, efficient irrigation techniques, um, all of which are helping them adapt to uh, climate change. And so um, I don't know if uh, Mushtaba, do you have anything to add kind of to that? Um, yeah, I think for Myanmar as well, um, another thing that's very prominent is water issues. Um, Myanmar as a country relies heavily on um, the grain fed irrigation and there's no proper water storage in some of those communities that uh, some of those rural communities that, that we work in. So for us, our focus was trying to provide those proper irrigation systems. So we work with uh, local um, uh, organizations that provide these irrigation, drip irrigation supplies or other irrigation uh, technologies as well. And it's also about just building the capacity. In 2018, for example, Myanmar suffered a devastating flood um, that destroyed a lot of the cropland that Mida uh, was was working, uh, the farmers that Mida were working with. And uh, we sort of started noticing that farmers were having difficulty sort of uh, rebounding from it. So Mida, along with a local partner, were able to provide these flood resistant seeds that were better able to sort of withstand the salinity of the water that was uh, sort of coming in. Um, and, you know, so it's that's something that has been a focus for us, um, you know, Katie, you know, you did a great job of sort of explaining some of the challenges. Um, one other thing that I will mention about sort of the fertilizer and chemical use is that um, Myanmar as a country relies a lot on imported fertilizers and imported chemicals, and that is a key issue um, in that farmers, when they receive this, it's usually in a different language, and they don't really understand how much of how much of it to use. So obviously you're going to overuse it because you want that you want the best uh, out of it and that is something that media has looked to so something working with harmony agro group is one example of how we're trying to um you know ensure that those fertilizers you know they're in the proper language they're in the local language as well as the capacity the training is there um, mm. for those farmers so they know exactly how much to input um, so yeah that's great wow that's amazing and I know that Mita is uh, doing other stuff as well outside of Myanmar too. So there's a, if I remember correctly, there's a briquette project that's happening in northern Nigeria as well. How is that kind of working to that help it restore our earth theme that we're talking about this uh, this month? Um, yeah, so I can speak a little bit to that and maybe um, Mushtaba can drill down kind of more into the specifics of it. Um, so deforestation is um, a common challenge across the world, um, especially in uh, the continent of Africa and in this region specifically, the north of Nigeria, um, which is contributing to de desertification and the ongoing expansion of the Sahara Desert um, mm -hmm. south. So um, this is really concerning, um, this ongoing desertification, because it's eating up arable uh, farmland, which um, is a threat to food security. Um, and so this deforestation is actually um, because the majority of cooking is done with charcoal, um, which is bad for forests, and also the burning of it is bad for indoor air quality. Um, and women actually do the most of, um, they resource the wood, as well as they do most of the cooking. So women are actually, um, uh, most at risk um, when it comes to this bad indoor air quality because of their cooking. Um, so the agricultural, the, the waste from this is also bad from the air. Um, as mentioned um, in, uh, in a blog post that we can feature, um, agricultural waste um, that lays barren basically is also bad for the air and it produces methane um, during the early onset of the rainy season. Um, so that also uh, impacts air quality. And so what we saw was an opportunity for this agricultural waste to be reused, um, specifically reusing peanut shells and rice husks um, to create kind of fuel briquettes for um, women to burn um, instead of uh, charcoal. And so what we did was we brought a group of men and women uh, together, predominantly women because they have more experience um, burning charcoal and uh, using firewood. Um, mm -hmm. training them, uh, farmers and micro business owners, um, teaching them how to reuse farming waste to earn an income, um, decrease waste and create safe fuel all at the same time. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so it kind of addresses uh, quite a few core issues at the same time. Um, yeah, so uh, Mushtaba, do you want to speak more to that? Yeah, no, I think uh, Katie did a great job. And yeah, I mean, with, 
you know, obviously the Nigeria project, it's it's called Women and Youth. So our focus on that project is on women and youth. Um, and, you know, these agricultural waste that, that Katie mentioned, that they were just, you know, pretty much there, nobody's using them. You know, for, for our project, we saw that as an opportunity to generate income um, for youth in the local community, in the local community. Um, so we've actually, ever since we've started the project, I think in its second year, we have been working with Brickets and a couple of Brickett manufacturers within Northern Nigeria as well. Um, so this, a whole goal, and as Katie mentioned, is to focus on women, but to ensure that these, these machinery that are being developed to uh, generate these brickets are machineries that is uh, that is gender responsive to ensure that they can be properly used by women by youth as long mm. as they obviously you have the potential uh, proper training and capacity building um, and in that way it's just a way um, to um, ensure that women still have access to it they can still mm -hmm. use it and it's not you know taken over um, by the like the men of the society for example mm. that women still have that uh, the businesses they can run um, so we have several training um, partners as well within the local communities that sort of train these women and youth and obviously bring in men as well who own some of these larger businesses as businesses as well. Um, and Brickett manufacturing used to be very, very expensive in northern Nigeria, obviously because firewood is cheaper, sometimes free, just cut down a tree. But brickets are kind of expensive and you have to wait for them to dry as well. So it's 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 quite a quite a process. But with these new machineries and this new processes, uh, businesses are, are noticing that um, it is much cheaper to just rely on brickets because it is sort of uh, 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 continuous, uh, like it, it is available continuously throughout the year. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's no restrictions placed on it as of right now anyways. Um, but with um, obviously, as Katie mentioned, with trees, deforestation, desertification in the Northern Sahara Desert. That's something that's continue, it is continuing to be a problem. So mm -hmm. um, that's something that we um, we're hoping to, ch um, to stop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it sounds like it actually works on two levels. You're not only, you know, increasing the economy there and and, and, and giving a, a voice to uh, to women and to, to youth there as well, but you're also working to, to, to stop that deforestation and, and work to restore the earth as well, which is phenomenal. That's that's amazing. So are there are there other environmental initiatives that are happening uh, that that meet is involved in uh, throughout the world or like, you know, I mean, I'm sure that there are, but let me is there anything else that we wanted to sort of highlight in today's call? Sure, um, and I think I'd, so I'll add a third layer to the Northern Nigeria oh. um, sort of our work with the Brickets is that Mita is also involved with the Great Green Wall Initiative. So the Great Green right. Wall Initiative is a North, it's a Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of those countries within Sub-Saharan Africa, it's an initiative that they have led to stop or reduce the spread of desertification. Um, so what they're trying to do is sort of plant trees. So usually you see it during Earth Day, countries like Ethiopia, Nigeria, they plant millions and millions of trees all, all in one day. Um, so for this, this project on Brickett is also part of that as well, where we're working with the local governments and as well as with the national governments to see how we could involve, um, how, how we could sort of potentially assist and support them um, in this great, great Green Wall initiative. So for Nigeria specifically, um, there, uh, I believe it was nine states, I believe, within northern Nigeria that fall within that Great Green Wall initiative and the Sahara, at the edge of the Sahara Desert. So those are the areas, four or four or five of them are the areas that we work in anyways. Um, so it definitely helps us um, sort of tackle yet another another problem while, you know, not changing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I can I can also just uh, give you another example as well. Sure. Um, in Tanzania, what we're doing so for Tanzania, our, ten, our project in Tan Tanzania is quite interesting because it is a project that is focused a lot on occupational health and safety. So as Katie oh. mentioned, um, you know in Nigeria, firewood the use of firewood indoors results in a lot of indoor pollution and uh, a lot of lot of health hazards as a result of it. In Tanzania, we we are taking a step beyond that. Um, where we're actually working with local governments as well as the national governments to um, officially certify or, uh, lead firms or companies that we're working with uh, to have these health certifications officially done by the government. So they're following certain practices. They have a health policy and an environment policy all uh, all set in stone, and they're strict. They have all these regulations and testing, all that all that stuff, and it's it's quite unique for the project in Tanzania, and that's something that we're hoping to uh, sort of take upon or sort of spread across different countries as well. Um, so so it's, it's just an example that, you know, um, and Katie mentioned this right at the start, is that each project country, even though MIDA may be doing 
one generic thing, you know, one general thing, each project country is different. Um, and sort of mm -hmm. we'll, we'll try to tackle the most, uh, sort of the most pressing issue in those countries. Mm -hmm. So those are just two examples, obviously, Ukraine and Nicaragua and uh, Kenya. There are other examples as well that they, oh, wow. that we're seeing in those countries. Amazing, amazing. So I want to kind of get into a little bit about your journeys and sort of how you folks uh, both sort of found Mita and and what you've been sort of getting out of 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 the uh, the experience of working with all of these amazing uh, initiatives and projects. So did you want to chat a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so I uh, first came uh, to Mita right after graduating. Um, and you know, I was really attracted to Mita's sustainable, um, solutions to poverty. Um, I've studied international relations in school and, um, you know, very passionate about having a job that was meaningful, but also uh, provide me with the opportunity to uh, use my skills to further a cause. Um, but I was very specific about what cause um, I would work on. And so um, Mita's cause, bl the blending of business um, with the environment, gender equality, um, you know, those are two areas that I was very passionate about, but then I added on new ones. So impact investing, um, learning about what that is, why that's important, how people's investments can um, change the world, can um, really further climate safe practices, environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, same with, you know, gender equality, investing in women owned businesses um, all over the world and understanding the impact of um, women's lack of access to financing for their business, uh, lack of um, investment um, and technical training um, and business training. So uh, my own understanding of the, the issues and causes I care about, I realized that they intersected perfectly with business, um, which is something that was new to me. And so, um, yeah, Mita's work is really galvanizing uh, because I work at Mita and I see the sustainable solutions. Um, and I hear about, you know, we just had um, a report, another blog post come out. Um, you know, we went back to a project in Pakistan that closed four years ago to see the longstanding impact. How How is our work still impacting women um, four, four more years after it closes? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I can see the sustainable longevity of the work that we do. And that's really inspiring. And I get to pe work with people like Mushtaba as well. And I get to learn from them all the time. And it's really great. Awesome. And Mushtaba yourself, how did you kind of get into this this role? Uh, yeah, I know part of it, I think, is exactly what Katie said. But in terms of my journey to getting to meet itself, um, I mean, I've been studying environment in my undergrad as well as my master's program as well. So and I, I my focus was on climate change, specifically climate change adaptation is, is sort of an area that I was very passionate about. Um, and again, I've, I've worked with the federal government as well as a couple of uh, local NGOs that are working within local communities here in Canada. Um, and, and for me, um, you know, it's all the work that they're doing is great. But having grown up in the global south, I wanted to see if there are organizations out there that can make the positive changes in those communities, you know, that I that I grew up in, um, you know, wanted to see if, if I can bring some of that positive change there. Um, and then I heard about Mita through one of um, one of my former classmates who used to work here. So I joined Mita as an intern, um, sort of taking over his role as he moved on to a PhD. So for me, you know, just staying at Mida, seeing that the growth of environment and climate change within Mida has been has been great. And it's 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 for me, it's great to be a part of it, to see that we are going into these new projects and current projects and and we're making this positive contribution. We're pro providing proper training um, as well as we're getting a lot back, where we're learning a lot about these local communities and some of the traditional methods of how they're uh, sort of tackling climate changes, things that you, you can't just read about unless you're there, you see it in person. It's, it's really hard to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. Amazing. So I, I want to I know we're kind of approaching the, the end of our time here, but there was one thing that I wanted to kind of focus on or finish with uh, with this interview. So there seems to be kind of a lot of discussion on your website around sort of the financial costs of climate change and sort of, you know, those impacts that we don't always necessarily think about, um, you know, from a longer term view. What's sort of one thing that that you'd like our viewers today to know about the financial cost of climate change and how it impacts them? <laughs> but it, but it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I think it's just because um, when you think about the financial cause of climate change, you you know, you hear people saying, oh, we have to spend 
more taxes or we have to spend more on this and more on that. Um, it seems like a burden, but what you're what you, what what is really hard to see is that climate change, you know, it's sort of a long term challenge. It's not something that happens right away. Sure, you get extreme weather. That will be one day of the year where it's really bad and you'll go through millions and billions of dollars of disaster. But climate change is just going to continue adding on to it slowly by slowly over the years. That could be droughts, that could be, uh, you know, um, monsoon seasons that come randomly. Um, and it's climate change is unavoidable. Um, so for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say that um, we, we, so what we do is we provide facts. We say that $2.9 trillion, that's the cost of extreme weather and climate change impacts over the past decade globally, obviously. Wow. And that has continued to increase over the past 20 years. Um, we're, we're not seeing this stop. And then, you know, you can't truly calculate the cost of that to the global south. We can put in the generic figures of infrastructure loss and this and that, but people's livelihood, people's income, people's even people's lives themselves, um, you know, that's something that we cannot put a cost on. Um, so okay. that's something that, you know, we want to say that you put a little bit of money, a little bit of money invested in trying to solve a particular challenge but you'll reap the benefit of it three, four, five years down the line. Um, you know, examples that I can give is, you know, organization or companies such as the Pacific Gas Electric. Um, in California, um, California has gone through a lot of wildfires. It is, a, it is, it, you know, as, an, as, as a company, climate change was something that they had really struggled with, how to properly adapt to it. And as a result, these wildfires that have um, uh, been partly due to climate change have bankrupted this company. Um, and this was a company that was providing these these uh, these resources to um, to uh, to Californians. Um, so yeah, I mean, and for me, I just say that you know, going back to the adaptation field, you know, climate change, as I said, is unavoidable. Um, you like our focus on mitigation and reducing gre greenhouse gas emissions is great. It so it solves the problems for our future generation. But things such as adaptation, where you're trying to properly ensure you have clim proper climate resilient infrastructures and you have all these seawalls and, you know, drought resistant seeds, they're there for now. Um, they're going to solve mm -hmm. your current problem where you can continue to adapt, can continue to survive. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, financial costs is just an additional cost, mm -hmm. but in the end, you are benefiting from it. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. So thanks so much, both of you, Katie and, and Mushtaba. Thank you very much for being on the line with me today. I appreciate the uh, the interview that we've had. I really, really love the uh, the stories that you've been able to tell. And, and I'm, I can't wait to actually turn that into a blog on our area and, and be able to use that and be able to promote the amazing work that Mita is doing. So I am going to say that that'll do it for us today. But thank you so much again for both of you for being with, with me today. And uh, yeah, we, we look forward to seeing what Mita does in the future. Thank you for having us.